We're in the middle of summer, which has often meant the summer blockbuster movie season. And to be honest, that used to be one of my favorite things to do. I haven't done it as much anymore because I'm more selective on what movies I want to go see. I'm really looking to go to the theater to have a wow factor experience. I want explosions. I want aliens. I want set pieces that are moving me into an incredibly new world I've never seen before. I want to go in there and audibly say, wow, more than one time. And I think for a lot of us, that's kind of a way that we look at things in our lives now. Like, I want to read a book that's going to make me say, wow, some of us watch reality television because we see all these crazy things going on, and wow just comes out of our our mouths. Uh, sometimes we do it with the food that we eat. I remember going to the Fish and Pig for the first time, which is a restaurant chain out in the middle of Virginia, and they had this loaded macaroni and cheese, and when it came out, that was the words that came out of my mouth, and it kept coming after I kept eating it. Sometimes we say it when we go to the state fair, and we've discovered that they have found a new item to try and deep fry. Or when we watch a fast car fly by us and that adrenaline rush hits us even though we're not the ones driving. The wow factor can be the scale we use to judge the entertainment in our life, but also to judge the things that go beyond entertainment. A lot of times we have huge problems, whether they're the things we see on the news or the things going on in our own lives, and we want the response to these huge problems to be just as big. We're looking for something impressive. And so we ask our doctors about the miracle drug that we saw on the YouTube ad, and we're drawn to these larger-than-life personalities that are wowing us with their loudness and their power and their influence. And these traits become desirable. They were impressive. And a lot of times their impressiveness is in how that drug is going to put the disease in its place or that person is going to put this group in their place and solve these big problems for us with their even bigger personalities and larger-than-life personas. We apply this to our relationships a lot of times, too, where we love the big feelings and these wow-factor romantic gestures, like when these prom proposals keep showing up all the time now that I see that I'm blown away by the creativity and by the level of commitment needed to pull some of these off or the lavish weddings or the bachelor dates and then something happens when those big elaborate things are over and it's just the day in day out life together and the feelings start to subside we believe something's wrong because the wow factor isn't hitting at the level it was before the wow factor is used to judge our own lives, too. We don't feel impressive, most of us. Instead, we feel repetitive. We feel mundane. We feel ordinary. The dishes come every day along with the laundry and the diapers. The grass has to always be cut. The meals always have to be made. We travel the same routes to and from work and school and soccer practice and the pharmacy. And we just are so ordinary. We wonder if we're even making a difference because we sure don't feel impressive. So something has to be off. And this wow factor scale can also be used to judge God's presence in our lives. If he is here with us in our country, in our church, in my own life, then if God is showing up in my life and he's present, then it should be an impressive display where he's at. I mean, he parted the Red Sea before. I'm looking for him to part the traffic on I-64. He had miraculous healings before. I need miraculous healings now. I'm son had stopped for Joshua in the middle of the battle so he could complete it on that day. My to-do lists are just as big of a battle and I need the sun to stop so I can complete them in one day. Or you hear people say, God told them to go and talk to somebody 
and he gave them this little bit of information about their lives and they just broke down and everything was great and you hear that and you wonder where is that for me and it's easy to feel jealous and insecure in our relationships with God when there doesn't seem to be a wow factor to it. It seems unimpressive. Our life seems ordinary, and we wonder if that's disqualifying us from being used of God or even having Him present in our lives. And I want to let you in on a little secret right at the very beginning here. We desire impressiveness. Giant displays like the openings of the Olympics draw our attention, and we desire more of it because of how it makes us feel. But while we desire impressiveness, God moves through kindness. And kindness doesn't typically feel impressive to us. It's not something we tend to call out as the number one thing we want in our candidates for office or for our boss or for our coach. It'd be nice if they're kind. But kindness, we don't think in our heads, is what's going to bring us victory. It's not what we think is going to help us win no matter what. And we want to be victorious. We want to be successful. We want to be impressive. And so kindness feels weak. Because if you're not looking out for number one, you're going to get taken advantage of, right? But kindness, especially in ordinary places, is a distinctive of God's character. In Genesis 24, Sarah has died, and Abraham will probably soon follow him. And so there is this one remaining thing in Abraham's life that he needs to ensure happens. He needs to find a wife for his son Isaac. Isaac is now uh, definitely of age. He is his own man, the, the mantle of from Abraham and all of Abraham's responsibilities are being passed to him. And so he takes his servant, Abraham does, and he makes him swear that he's going to go find this bride for Isaac. He wants him to go back to the land that Abraham came from to his family to find somebody that will have uh, be from that family. And the only thing about it is he has a promise to do that, and he has to promise that Isaac will not leave the promised land to go back with this woman if she doesn't want to come, Isaac can't go to her because it's going to be hard to and promise. Uh, it's going to be hard to inherit the promised land when you leave it. And so the servant agrees. He swears to it, and then he loads a brink truck worth of gifts onto ten camels and heads out to find this woman. And after he finally reaches the area where she's supposed to be, this is what happens. Then he prayed, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside the spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I will water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever lain with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. Then the servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water from your camels too until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well for more water, and drew enough for all his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring, weighing a becca, and two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels. And then he asked, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, or to Nahor. And she added, We have plenty of strong fodder as well as room for you to spend the night. Then the man bowed down and worshipped the Lord, saying, Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham. 
who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. He goes on from there to meet the rest of the family, to give them the gifts he's brought, and Rebecca agrees to leave and not stay there anymore. And we read that when he uh, gets to Isaac and she meets him, that Isaac takes her into his mother's tent to make her the new matriarch of the family, and he loves her. The servant had prayed specifically for God's kindness to be shown through one of the women and her kindness to him. Kindness, not impressiveness, is how God describes him the very self. One of the words that's used here and lots of other places is hesed, which means loving kindness when it's applied to God. And it is, it's even so much more than we can tend to wrap up in what loving kindness means. But in Exodus 34, God is redoing the Ten Commandments with Moses. And before going down to the people, God comes to him and says who he is. And he doesn't list his glory or his power or what he did in Egypt to bring them out. He says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in chesed, love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands. And it's only after this distinctiveness is declared by God that he goes on to list the impressive things he's going to do for the people of Israel. But it is the loving kindness of God that defines him for us here. It is the loving kindness of God that quickly responds to the servant's prayer. It is the prevenient grace of God that is the kindness that provides the right moment and the willing heart for him to meet Rebecca. And it is the kindness of God that often goes before us to provide exactly what we need when we need it. It is kindness, not impressiveness, that we use to introduce God to the broken world around us. According to Jesus, we don't reveal God in our lives by our power, our loudness, our violence, our influence, or anything else other than the fact that we are known to be his followers by our love. And so Rebecca joins this family of promise through kindness. And she showed it in three ways, if you look at it. She showed it through respect. That there is this stranger that shows up. She can probably tell he's a servant by some of the ways that he's adorned. And she he, she is approached by this man, and yet she still honors him. She who belongs to a family that is used to being honored. And then she listens to him as he tells what he has to tell. And the whole time through, she has this attitude of diligence where she is working hard as a sign of respect for this person that's come to her. And that hard work and diligence shows up in another way that she was kind through serving. It's no small thing to get enough water for 10 camels. She had to go above and beyond what was asked of her to be able to accomplish this. He just asked for a drink of water for himself. She was the one who said, not only that, but let me take care of everyone that's here, including all of your animals. And then she served through hospitality. Her kindness showed up when her attitude and her service combined to make a welcoming place. Not only was her home opened, but there was a relational space for the servant to come and be present and to not have to worry or feel unsafe. There are all kinds of ways that you and I can do those sorts of things in our life. To show respect to people, to serve them, to make it so that they feel warm and invited and safe in our presence. And we can do these things because kindness isn't just something we do. It is a fruit of the Spirit, which means it is supernatural. And in ordinary moments of life, it counts more because it is harder to react 
as a Christian than it is to act as a Christian. If I know I need to respond to something, I can get ready and get prepared, of course I'll be okay. But when it just shows up and I've got to deal with it, what's inside comes out. And I supernaturally need the Spirit of God filling me in order to be kind in those kinds of circumstances. Because the Spirit flows, the loving kindness of God, through us to those who are around us, those that don't deserve it, those that won't return it to us, those that we wish we could avoid. Anyone can be kind to people that you like. You can give good gifts to people, give you good gifts and things like that, but it takes the Spirit to love your enemies, to pray for those who persecute you, and to be kind in the face of those who are against you. And because it is supernatural, because it is a distinctive quality of God himself, our kindness is much more powerful than we give it credit for. Even in, especially in the mundane, in and out of our lives, it is kindness moving through us that transforms us and the world around us. Steve Storgren, I butchered his name, but he is a, a pastor who's pastored all over the world, um, tells the story of how one day he was ordering a drink on a Sunday morning in a coffee shop, and he noticed a couple behind him who were looking kind of rough. The woman had a legal size yellow pad, a big pen in her hand, and he asked what they were having to the barista so he could put all of their drinks on his card. And as they waited in line for the drinks to arrive, he wondered um, how late he was going to be to the next appointment he was supposed to have. He was supposed to be speaking at his friend's church in Columbus, and he was still in Cincinnati, and things were, were kind of slowing himself down. And then this is what he says happens next. As we waited for our drink to arrive, the man asked, So what's up with the coffee? Why'd you buy ours? I responded, I'd like to buy coffee for people in line behind me. It's a small way to say God is in love with you. If Jesus were at Starbucks this morning, he'd be showing his love, not just talking about it. And that woman let out a loud, guttural cry, almost a groan, but a high volume. It was loud enough that the dozens of people suddenly got quiet and looked at me as though I had caused this to happen. The woman was so spent from her wailing, she was winded, as though she'd finished an aerobic workout. As she quieted down, he put an assuring hand on her back and said, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. He continued with me. Last night, our 19-year-old daughter went to a party. She took the drug ecstasy. For whatever reason, the drug stopped her heart. She fell to the ground and died. We're here to plan her funeral service. As we pulled into the parking spot, my wife said, we're Jewish but aren't religious. We aren't faithful to go to temple. Still, I want to know where God is in all of this. And then five minutes later, we stand in line, and you tell us this coffee is on you to show us God's love in a practical way. We don't know what to say. Who are you? What do you believe? Kindness is transformative. We look for the impressive and the big, and God moves through ordinary acts of kindness. So the question is, how are you going to let God work through you this week? You see, when you think you're just going through the motions and everything's the same, you are doing something and set up to do something way more powerful, way more transformative than you realize if you're willing to let the God of loving kindness work through you online at home, and in your community. Are you willing to be kind? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would put in our hearts your heart. Help us supernaturally to love those around us with acts of kindness, showing them respect, serving them, making a place hospitable and warm for them to be truly themselves and to be safe. We do this not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it shows the world who you are. 
that kindness, loving kindness, is a distinctive characteristic of our God. And if we're his people, then we're empowered to live that out too. Lord, I pray you would give us some specific and intentional ways that we could be kind this week. May we not just wait for it to happen, but may we go looking for the chance to do something in your name, even in, especially in, the ordinary and mundane parts of life. We pray this in your name. Amen.